Hello, my name is John Bennett. I'm here in support of the supramolecular vaccine. The supramolecular vaccine is basically a homeopathic remedy used to immunize with. This is the new immunology I'm talking about. A lot of people flip when they hear this, hear that somebody's promoting the use of homeopathic remedies to, uh, for, in place of the old vaccine, vaccines. So as a part of, as the bulwark of the support for this idea of the use of homeopathic remedies to, to immunize people from various diseases and conditions, I've taken it upon myself to try to explain to people how these materials work. What's the basic fundamental structure and charge of these materials? And I say structure and charge because those are the two issues really at stake. What is the structure, the chemical structure of these materials that are used in homeopathy, these highly diluted materials? And what is their charge? All of the things that I'm talking about, for the most part, have been validated by physical and chemical experiments. The physical, this is the physical chemistry of the homeopathic remedy. And it goes back a long ways. Now, oddly enough, there have been meta-analyses of homeopathic clinical trials. And the majority of these meta-analyses have concluded that homeopathy is not a placebo. Now, that's not what you're going to hear from people who are against homeopathy, people who cloak their ignorance as skeptics. People like James the Amazing Randy, who's made a career of bashing homeopathy, or David, Professor David Calhoun, of an English professor who's made a career out of bashing homeopathy, or Penn and Teller magicians. This is something that magicians like to pick on because they think they're experts in hoaxes and, and homeopathy has been considered a hoax. But what little people know is the secret history of the homeopathic remedy, the physical chemi chemical basis of it that was discovered over a hundred years ago. So oddly enough, these, one of these meta-analyses meta came to the conclusion that homeopathy could be accepted as clinical medicine, could be accepted for clinical use. Pardon me while I get comfortable, try to get comfortable here, I stiffen up. They could, it could be used for clinical use if the mechanism was known. Now, what they mean by the mechanism, I'm not really sure. This is a, I'm speaking of a meta-analysis that was published in the British Medical Journal back in the early 1990s. British Medical Journal. Uh, a magazine of good repute, <laughs> a medical journal, one of the top medical journals, probably right behind the Lancet in Nature Magazine for, for its impact. And after reviewing many clinical trials, over 100, I think, of homeopathy, they concluded that they could accept homeopathy if they knew what the mechanism was. Well, I find this real interesting because the mechanism was revealed in my research was revealed over 100 years ago, 1909 to be exact, in a magazine called the Chiron, which makes mention by uh, Royal S. Co Royal S. Well, now my mind's going blank. Copeland. <laughs> The terror of all people making a public presentation that your mind will go blank. Copeland was a uh, medical doctor who later on became a senator and the chief sponsor of the FDA or the FDCA, the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, which is basically the commission for the uh, Federal Drug Agency. Federal. <laughs> 
The Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. The law, the law, the law supports homeopathy. It's probably mostly due to Senator Copeland, who was a homeopath, a medical doctor who had been trained in homeopathy. And in 1909, Copeland wrote an article on the scientific reasonableness of homeopathy. And it's really a fascinating article. If you have the time, and I'm sure you do, for something this important, and you have an interest in homeopathy, if you're a professional or if you're an enthusiast like myself, you, you have to read this article because it comes up with a couple of very interesting observations. One is that the homeopathy follow the homeopathic remedies pretty much follow the, the periodic table in their symptomology. If you go and look at through, I believe it's the periods on the on the period on the periodic table, you find that the remedies when you go back and look at them through the Materia Medica, the semiological registers of the effects, of the symptomology of, of homeopathic remedies. There's about a thousand of them in Clark, which is listed as the authority by the FDA in its uh, statute regulating homeopathy. You see, this gets wider as it gets deeper. You find that there actually is a tremendous amount of support, scientifically and clinically, physical in its physical makeup and its chemical makeup, its biochemical effects. There's a lot of support for it in the literature. The literature is quite profound. It's quite robust. The literature for homeopathy, technical literature, clinical and scientific and otherwise. The second thing in this article by Copeland is that he reveals the mechanism of homeopathy to be molecular dissociation. That's a real wow. That early they had it nailed. And I took it upon myself to look this up, to start studying molecular dissociation to see what that means. And it's brought me around to a whole different look at what physics, the physics of the nuclear physics and atomic physics, standard model of physics, has basically doesn't, and I think this is a, this is a problem that modern science is having with homeopathy, that it doesn't exactly follow the standard model of physics, because I think the reason for this is because the standard model of physics is wrong. It's what I call the standard model of failure. You know, they say, well, if you can prove homeopathy, they'll have to rewrite all the textbooks. Well, the Physics, physics textbooks. Yeah, that's right. They, they have to rewrite them anyway. <laughs> as long as they're rewriting the, the textbooks for the standard model of, of physics, they ought to throw in homeopathy as an explanation as well. And I basically come to the conclusion that, that, the, that the particle is basically a, a, um, a hologram. And it's not really a particle. It's more of a structure that uh, is sort of an infinite structure. It's a little hard to talk about sometimes. That's what the infinitesimal is. So anyway, you need to read this article and check that out, what Copeland has to say about, about it. Copeland was, was is like the godfather to homeopathy in my mind. And I'll put a link to the scientific reasonableness of homeopathy in the uh, in the comments section or the description section if you're watching on YouTube in the text section text below the uh, video in the John Bennett Journal if you're watching it there. And uh, leave me a comment, you know, tell me what you think about that. That basically, we've answered all these questions. We've shown that, we've shown that, the, that, that it's molecular dissociation, basically the breakdown of the molecule by uh, 
hydrolytic forces in, in the water by hydrogen. So this is why I've taken such an interest in hydrogen that it's conventionally known to split the molecule up into ions. It ionizes the, turns it into electrons. The electrons are basically holograms of the molecule. Or more correctly to say that the molecule is a hologram of its of its electrons. So it, it challenges, I think, some of the basic concepts that we have of what the molecule is. And it's kind of a paradigm shift. They're starting to come around. There's a, a, a an article that's talk, that mentions dissociation on home, the article on homeopathy that mentions dissociation that I'll also put a, a uh, link to the article that just recently came out. So I think the more I keep talking about this, more likely it is that, that they're going to start picking up on it. Some of these advanced thinkers, some of these Nobel Prize winning scientists who have approached this subject. And I count five Nobel Prizes amongst men who have taken upon themselves to look at aspects of the homeopathic remedy, such as Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes, probably the top Nobel Prize winner, winning two Nobel Prizes 100%. And I'll include a picture of him too, holding a model of, of uh, hydrogen bonding in water, st the structure of liquid water which is a thesis he came up with, I get from what somebody said, he came up with in 1920, the 20s. So these, these concepts of structure and charge, more charge than and dissociation, or I should say more structure than is known about, than about the charge. So this is why I've kind of focused on charge, the energy, the electrons that are basically what makes homeopathy lightning lightning in a bottle. So check out these articles and give me some feedback on this because this is very important. It's not just a game or a hobby. We need a new vaccination schedule or to be more appropriate, more, a more prophylaxis schedule for immunology to immunize people. These materials can immunize against just about anything. And if you look at the, I could suppose I could include a link to this article by, or a study by Wayne Jonas of the Samulus Institute, who was a National Institute of Health director, who conducted a test with uh, Deborah Dillner on immunizing mice against tularemia. This, and, and this is a profound study he did also did an MR, NMR check on it because he found that they found that it did work, and they basically were looking at the use of these materials against bioterrorism because it can be made up easily to counteract just about anything. If you look at the Materia Medica, the semiological registers, the fundamental literature of homeopathy. It covers about over 70,000 symptoms. And there's enough there and enough experience in epidemics, the use of these materials in epidemics to warrant further study on your part. We need to get these things out there. Everybody should have access to these materials in the event of a biological attack or a sudden epidemic that we have no conventional vaccine for. The convention should now be these vaccines. It is my proposition to, to you that the mechanism, the so-called mechanism, the charge within the homeopathic remedy is essentially the same charge that works in these molecular vaccines, these dirty molecular <laughs> vaccines. What are called mud vaccines? The vaccine is homeopathic. I've been say, stating this repeatedly like on Twitter, people go, oh, well, you're crazy. Even the homeopaths, I think some homeopaths don't like hearing this. That the vaccine is a homeopathic effect of like cures like. 
the first vaccine, but coming from the word vaca, meaning cow, was the smallpox vaccine that Jenner promoted. But up until that point, they'd been using virulation, which was using the, the, the serum from the smallpox pustule to take a little dried pus from a smallpox boil or pustule and cut that into the crease of your, of your ass cheek, of your buttock. And it's called virulation in order to immunize people against smallpox, the scourge of mankind. The problem with that is it's very dangerous. You can give somebody smallpox by trying to immunize them from it. So they lose people in the, occasionally. But this is a, cla the, the, a classic example of like cures like, or in the case of variolation, same cures can cure same. But the refinement was the smallpox vaccine when they noticed that milkmaids had pock marks on their hands, but not on their face. They never got smallpox. They were essentially inoculated by it from milking cows who had, would be regularly infected by bovine variola, which would be the cowpox. So this, I believe, was Hahnemann's aha, his, his, uh, his eureka, that the smallpox vaccine was a demonstration, a molecular demonstration of like cures like, or like immunizes against like, but that can do one and one and both. And I, I find it puzzling to see people rejecting not only the idea of there being physical chemical tests that prove homeopathy and now theory that proves it, but also the relationship between that and immunization. I mean, this could be really important. This could save the human race for all I know. I mean, because you can apply, if you're a homeopath, you know this is true, that you can cook up a, cook up a, 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 find a remedy for just about everything. I found one for Ebola and sent a package of uh, Crotalus horridus to Monrovia, Liberia. And within a couple of weeks, the, the, the uh, epidemic subsided. That's a pretty strong claim to make on a YouTube video. When I'm telling you this is all true, the, you're probably familiar, you may, may or may not be familiar with the, the Cuban, the use by Cubans of electrospirosis uh, remedy to immunize against that disease. So we, we know these things work. We've seen repeated demonstrations of it. I'd appreciate it if you sh share this video with somebody and give me a hand. You can reach me at jrbenneth at aol.com. Send me something. I need help. Help me. Help me. Oh, here's Hudson. You want to say hi to everybody, Hudson? There he is. Can you see him? Hi, what have you been up to? We like to eat some apples and cheese. Give him a piece of apple or give him a piece of cheese. Come here. You want an apple and cheese? Give you a, a piece of cheese. And then because he's a French poodle, you need to clench, cleanse the palate with some apple, apple and cheese. He loves that. He's not your typical French poodle. You have to be kind of stuck up to be a French poodle. He's not, he's just a regular guy. His nickname is Buster. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for, for uh, watching my video and uh, looking forward to the next time we may meet again.